Today I want to talk to you about the importance of territories, home ranges and territorial markings left behind by animals. Why they do it, how they do it and when they do it and why it's so important to their survival. Imagine your senses were so heightened that you could see things from a mile away. You could smell the tiniest scent particle that was left behind. And imagine those little signals left behind were so important and crucial for your survival. Hello everyone, my name is Andrew. Today I want to talk to you about the importance of territories, home ranges and territorial markings left behind by animals. Why they do it, how they do it and when they do it and why it's so important to their survival. So first off, what is a territory? Well, a territory is a piece of land that an animal decides that they are going to actively mark, defend and chase all other members of the same species away from in order to ensure their survival or their offspring's survival with the best possible chance. A territory is different from a home range. A home range is a general piece of ground where an animal survives and lives on its daily basis. They don't fight for that piece of ground, they don't defend against it, they don't actively mark it or anything like that. It's generally where the animal lives day to day and carries out its daily tasks, eating, feeding and sleeping. Where a territory is actively marked, actively defended and it can be seasonal or it can be permanent. So what we're going to look at over the next little while is a few important species and their territorial markings. Things like lions, things like cheetah, things like leopard. I suppose a couple of the big cats, how their territorial markings are similar and dissimilar at the same time. We'll also look at things like rhinos and how their territories are similar and dissimilar. So as much as there's animals that have territories, there's also animals that don't have territories. Things like giraffe and elephant. They fight for dominance within an area, within their home range, that'll secure breeding rights, but not necessarily a territory. So join me over the next few days as I head out into the bush and I spend time with these animals and I look at how they go about their lives, their daily tasks and duties, marking their territories and indeed coexisting with one another as each of their territories might overlap with one another. I've got two cheetah on the side over here. So let's, uh, let's use them as our first example and have a look at some of their behavior. So this is a coalition of cheetah. As we said before, any males born of the same litter to a female, when they get uh, to the right age, generally two, two and a half years, they'll move off and they'll become nomadic until they're old enough to, to hold their own territory. And the fact that those two boys are together means that they can hold a bigger territory. It can overlap more females who have their own territories and it'll allow them to hold and compete for the best territories for the longest period of time. You can have a coalition of even four cheetah males and there's obviously a, a hierarchy and a ranking amongst them within that coalition. So these cheetah, these males, within their territory and a territory is essentially a piece of land that these guys have decided is the, the best possible land for their survival in terms of access to food, water, defense against whatever that may be. As you can see, these guys are permanently looking, scouting all over their territory, around their surroundings the whole time, making sure that they can see any predators coming in. As we've seen, lions just so readily want to be able to get hold of these guys and take them out. So, really staying on top of their game. The way cheetah mark their territory is to actively patrol the perimeter of the territory and they will scent, scent mark and spray urinate against bushes. As you can see this guy is, well, on cue. <laughs> So that's a way that that cheetah will actively 
demarcate and say to any other cheetah that are in this area, this is our territory. And they'll do that through olfactory communication, scent communication. After it's rained, these guys would need to patrol their territory again and make sure that that scent is refreshed on a regular basis. What you need to remember when you're looking at these cheetah is although they're living on Shamari Game Reserve, there will be some interspecific competition competition between these guys and possibly lions but for the most part their communication is not really known or understood by other animals and vice versa in other words when these guys are scent marking and a lion walks past they'll smell it but it doesn't really mean anything more to them than other than they will know that's a cheetah whereas if another cheetah smells cheetah urine there's so much information that they will know from that and be able to gather from that age, sex, reproductive status, and obviously the message of why that urine is there. Is it for a territorial marking or is it from a female? So species specific, they can gain so much information from that. Other animals from different species, they will be able to identify, but it doesn't give them the amount of information that they would get if they were from that species. All of this needs to be weighed up as time versus energy expended. In other words, the markings that are left behind, are they going to be effective in communicating a message? It's pointless that animals leave markers and messages somewhere obscure where another animal of the same species will never come across it and therefore the message never gets conveyed. So a lot of the time territorial markings are done at beacon points, in other words, exposed termite mounds or exposed trees or on road crossings. And this is a perfect example over here. Prides of lions are territorial, and a, a pride will define a territory and sometimes for generations hold that same territory. They're obviously fighting or trying to defend the most productive ground. In other words, best access to resources and prey and, and that type of stuff. Lions will mark their territory in a number of different ways. Some of the communication they leave behind is visual. In other words, the lion can see another lion's markings left behind. This is a visual marking. Not only is it a visual marking where the lion has scratched the tree and left these deep, deep, deep rake marks behind, visually it can be seen from a way off, but there's olfactory communication there as well. Olfactory communication is scent communication. So as lions are busy raking the tree, it provides a number of benefits. Number one, it sloughs off old sheaths on the claws, so sharpening the claws, but it also transfers a scent. Lions have got scent glands on the paws and this raking of the tree deposits a scent and as they walk off, it'll transfer a scent as well. So obviously visual and olfactory communication here in one shot. And it's at a, a very noticeable tree. Uh, it's a beacon point, it's a marker within this area. Lions will also spray urinate backwards against bushes and trees. And as they do that, they're obviously leaving a scent particle behind. They'll then rake their feet backwards and kick up the ground a little bit and that raking of the feet also transfers scent particles to the, to the feet and the claws and as they walk, they'll deposit the scent trail over a much larger area when they're patrolling their territories. Another important way that lions communicate and mark territory is by roaring. That is vocal communication. The upside of that is that message is instantaneously transferred to as many different lions within a given area as possible and instantly. The downside of it is it only lasts as long as the call is being made for. As soon as that lion stops calling, the message then ends and the communication is broken. So something like olfactory communication can last for a very long time. And what we see after rain is, is most territorial animals will go again and make sure that they enforce the borders of their territory to make sure that any scent particles that were washed away, they now put fresh particles there and ensure it's nice and strong and fresh. Something else that lions do but is not unique to them and indeed we'll see this with most of the other cats that we look at is facial rubbing. They also do that with one another and also on trees and bushes. They've also got scent glands around their lips and whiskers that transfer a scent particle. So what's the point of all this time and energy expenditure marking territories? Well, it's to convey a message. Every time those animals leave scent particles behind, they're leaving pheromones behind and they're leaving chemical signatures to tell other members of the same species, this is my territory, stay out, it's occupied. But saying that, it doesn't mean that a cheetah won't come and utilize this area as well. A cheetah doesn't understand or realize this, the chemical messages that a lion has left behind, for example. 
very often what we'll see is members of different species utilizing the same area. In a rhino midden, for example, you'll often find black and white rhino middens together, as well as jackal dung inside of there as well. And they don't speak the same language, so to say. They don't understand the message that is getting conveyed, although they'll understand it's from a different animal. And that's the important thing, is territorial markings are only for members of the same species to convey their messages, whether it be reproductive status, territorial status, health status, even the mood can be conveyed in a lot of these pheromones that are getting left behind. So vitally important. So here's a fairly recently used white rhino midden. You can see this whole area around me over here is all covered in this very uh, large balls of dung, which is purely made up of grass. And that dark black covering on the outside tells us white rhino. And uh, you can see some of it has been kicked up and scraped by the territorial males. And some of it has just been deposited by either females or non-territorial satellite males. In a lot of the middens, we have these funny looking plants busy growing with these very spiky balls. If we open the balls up, this one's already lost all of its seeds, but they're filled with black seeds, which I'll open one up for you now. This is called a detura, or a thorny apple, or malpita. Malpita means crazy pips, directly translated. It's an invasive plant. It's now found worldwide. And as toxic, toxic as it is, there's the seeds on the inside of the plant. As toxic as this plant is to us as humans, uh, it contains a, a huge amount of very toxic uh, alkaloids that if we ingest it, uh, very potentially fatal. Black rhino eat it. Black rhino have the ability to eat euphorbias, Datura, a whole bunch of very, very toxic plants. Their digestive system is able to handle the alkaloids and uh, toxic chemicals. It would, it would just kill us. Livestock can't eat it. Uh, very toxic to most animals. So where we're sitting now is a, a rhino midden that's predominantly used by white rhino. Most of what we can see is white rhino uh, dung with all the grass content and the dark black covering on the outside of the dung. Uh, if we scratch through this grass, we will find twigs. Actually, there it is there. There's twigs with a 45 degree angle cut, and that is dung from a black rhino. In areas where black rhino and white rhino occur, uh, most of the time they will jointly use the middens. In any case, the a white rhino will set up the midden and the black rhinos will come and utilize those middens. They're not in competition with one another, it's just uh, you know, the most convenient place to communicate a message. So from a social point of view, rhino middens are phenomenally important. We've seen how social white rhino can be, and for those reasons, rhino middens are very important. There's a lot of information that gets communicated uh, to members of the same species in these rhino middens, whether it be health, age, reproductive status, uh, all of that type of information is contained over here, and it gives information to individuals to allow them to know uh, where they can go, where they can't go, who else is around, and what's happening in rhino society. cheetah over here that have uh, we saw them in the distance it looked like they were hunting they started low profile and now they are very very unhappy as they move out of this area and uh, just coming over the ridge over there they've spotted a male lion as we've spoken about competition before and looking at cheetahs and lions and their interaction we know that cheetahs uh, they can't hold their own against lion so they're competing for the same food sources, they're competing in the same area. I mean, here we are in exactly the same area. We've got lion and cheetah. They do not like one another, and lions will kill cheetah when they get the chance. So lucky that these guys, they saw that male lion coming over the ridge. You know, we looked at their body behavior, and we had this low profile when we came in. It looked like they possibly were hunting in this area, um, starting to, to scout over these uh, ridges and see if there are any red hartebeest coming up over here. There's still a lot of youngsters. That, uh, that were born a few months ago, so that's the type of prey that they're busy targeting. And then obviously um, 
it was because of that lion coming over the ridge that they've got wind of him now and they've moved off. Uh, we're just going to sit here for a little bit longer and see where the male lion moves to and we might try and find those cheetah again as they've moved off and we'll stick with them for a bit. So we've just managed to catch up with uh, these two cheetah over here and they're still very, very nervous. They still keep on looking back. And we've, we've moved in the order of about a kilometer and a half to catch up with these guys. You can see they're moving into thick bush. They really want to try and get away. I'm not too sure if that male lion has picked up on the scent and busy trailing them. I won't know that for a little bit longer. So we're going to stick with these guys. So we'll see if their behavior relaxes down or if they pushed completely out of this area into a new, uh, into a new area. We are surrounded by areas of very dense vegetation and then much more open savanna and grasslands. Obviously cheetah, they prefer the open grasslands and savanna and the thick areas they would avoid. They would just move through them, use it as a bit of cover for now. These two guys have quite a wide range on the reserve, uh, their, their core territory. So they would move through these areas, they wouldn't necessarily utilize them. There are instances where these cheetahs can be quite successful on the edges of these savanna scattered woodland areas. It's almost as if they, they try and flush animals out of the thicker vegetation onto the plains and then they'll hunt from there. So uh, again, using it to their advantage, we're gonna move out onto an open area now and we'll see maybe, uh, maybe they relax down. So these guys are being quite clever. They are, uh, again, using height to their advantage. They will never win a fight against a lion, but they will win a straight line run race with them. So as long as these guys are keeping vigilant and aware of their surroundings, as we've said before, cheetah are quite nervous. They never sleep like lions do. You know, you can walk into the middle of a pride of lions <laughs> and they won't wake up until the last second. Where cheetah are hyper vigilant lie down for a little bit, eyes closed, head up again, looking around. And these guys have now come onto an opposite ridge, uh, a separate hill to where we were. And they're now busy looking back to see if that lion actually picked up on them or if that lion was just on, on part of his uh, normal territorial patrol. And the uh, lion might be completely unawares of these cheetah. So just looking back towards that ridge where the cheetah initially were when we found them and they, they saw that male lion coming over that ridge over there. So we've moved quite far. We are now the opposite valley, the opposite hill. And looking back onto that opposite ridge over there, I've got a lot of zebra. They're all super relaxed. I don't think that male lion picked up on those cheetah. I think that, that male lion was just on one of his normal territorial patrols, busy uh, marking territory as he was going. I think he's going to meet up with the rest of the pride. We did hear one brief uh, contact call and that was it and uh, the rest of those animals up on that ridge line are completely, completely relaxed. So I think we're gonna try and follow up with these cheetah a little bit. They have moved down into this thicker bush over here, whether they've decided they're just gonna hunker down for the day still remains to be seen. So we've got a dense block of vegetation over here, about 100 meters wide and about 200 meters long. The cheetah have gone in there, they haven't come out. I think they're gonna hunker down here for the day. We've been looking at that ridge over there, the lion hasn't crested over at all. So I think they, uh, they obviously got their initial uh, forewarning sight on that line. They managed to get away. They, they really, I mean, you can see how cheetah hightail it out of an area. They're, they cannot stand their ground against line at all, and they'll rather just move away instead of any form of uh, conflict at all. And uh, it's that forewarning that uh, it allows them to uh, basically hold the upper, the upper game the whole time. I think they're going to be in here for most of the day. We can't get to them. I don't want to put any more pressure on them by trying to walk in there or anything. There's, there's no point to that. So we're just going to leave them here. They, they managed to get their, their heads up on the lion. So uh, another safe day for them. I'm going to head back over that ridge and see if we can find that lion. When this guy's youngsters get to about two and a half years of age, he pushes them out of the pride. They're not welcome anymore. They have to become nomadic animals. They won't be strong enough to hold a pride of their own and they're forced into an area 
where there aren't great resources and there aren't necessarily other prides of lions. If they do wander into another pride territory, they'll get kicked out even further. They'll get pushed into the next pride territory and get kicked out even further. And before you know it, when they are ready to take over a territory and a pride of their own, they'll be so far away from their natal pride that when they do start mating, you don't have inbreeding. And that's one of the benefits of being a territorial animal. So although lions and lioness are territorial, both male and female, the male lion has a very, very large territory. And very often a coalition of males or an individual male, their territory will encompass a number of different female prides. They can move between prides of females. So the males want to try and have a larger territory as possible to cover as many female prides as possible so that they can mate and have as many offspring as possible. The females want to control their territory, the best access to resources, which is food, water, and obviously safety. The other thing about territories is they are very dynamic. They change from season to season and year to year. Some territories are very, very stable, and for years they'll be in existence, as long as the resources are there to allow the animal to validate having to defend this territory. And that's the point with a lot of these territories, whether it be lion, leopard, cheetah, they're all territorial within an area, but those territories are dynamic, they change, they move with seasons sometimes, depending on the species, and as resources change as well. So it was great the last couple of days spending time with these animals, looking at territories, looking at communication, how they do it, why they do it, and why it's so important to them. So in a future episode, we're going to be looking at all the ecological aspects, a lot of the data that we've collected over the, the last number of years, pride territories, communication, animals, the pride composition, all of that type of information. We're going to be looking at why it's important from an ecological point of view and all of that different data that we're busy collecting on a daily basis, how it's important, why it's important, and look at how that fits into managing reserves. So we'll see you soon. Be safe. If you haven't followed us yet, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and hit that notification bell. Stay tuned for our next episode, and I'll see you right here at Shamori Private Game Reserve.